and discussion. You're welcome to attend any part of the evening, but space is limited. It'll be on a first come, first serve basis. Elizabeth Riley, where are you, Elizabeth? Right back there, waving her hand, knows all about this. So if you'd like to ask her any questions, please do so after the program. The Citizens Book Read Group is called Midnight at the Dragon Cafe for this year, or for this month. It'll be meeting on February 26th at 7 o'clock. For more information about these programs and everything else going on at City Club, please check your bulletin or go to our website, pdxcityclub.org. We have a new member that I'd like to introduce today and have you welcome. Her name is Jennifer Bates. She's from Reed College. Would you please stand, Jennifer? <laughs> welcome to City Club. We're so fortunate in Portland to have great corporate citizens that help make our programs possible. Our sponsors this quarter are Girding Edlin Development Company, LLC, and McEwen Giswold, LLP. Would you please join me in thanking our sponsors? <laughs> our program today is entitled Portland as a Film City, coinciding nicely with the opening of the Portland International Film Festival. Portland is a film mecca. We have over 600 releases here every year. It's a city of film festivals, lots of independent films, interesting alternative venues for viewing. Portland's also a place where films are made. Our speaker today is Sean Levy, film critic for The Oregonian. I have to say that Sean has a very unusual job. This man sees and writes about 250 films a year. He's already seen 50 in 2007. He has, this is a busy time of year for him, so we're particularly lucky to have him. Now this may sound like fun, but the fact of the matter is that for every film he sees, he has to write, he has to meet deadlines, and first of all, he must be a journalist. Sean writes for thinking people, and those of us that hope we fall into that group appreciate him a lot. So how in the world does someone train for a job like this? Well, just as you'd expect, he has a degree in comparative literature. He has an MFA in poetry from UC Irvine. Fortunately for us, Sean, who is a New Yorker, married an Oregonian in graduate school. They moved to Oregon in 1992. Sean is the author of four books, the father of three children, the keeper of one big dog and one little bird, Please join me in welcoming Sean Levy. Thanks very much uh, for the invitation, the, the kind introduction. Um, it's amazing to see so many people here, given that there's a new movie with Eddie Murphy in a fat suit. I would have thought people would be lined up around the block for that. Um, <clears throat> you know, Portland is, uh, what, like the 24th biggest city in the country, more or less, depending on how you do the counting and how you mash the numbers. And when it comes to movies with Eddie Murphy in a fat suit, we are about the 24th in wanting to see them, um, which is to say not very much, but in line with our population. However, when it comes to uh, what are called in the business specialty films, independent films, foreign films, documentaries, Portland um, jumps from 24th, where it belongs in population, to 15th and as high as 10th in the country. Not in per capita sales, but in actual tickets sold. Uh, we, we are a city that's famous in the film industry for embracing small films, offbeat films. We get films more frequently in this market as the years go by before bigger cities get them, and in many cases, we hold on to movies, small movies, longer than they've ever played in New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, San Francisco. In some cases, all four of them combined. It, it's, it's a strange phenomenon, and, and I think it has to do 
oh, with the reason that, you know, we have such a great bookstore down the road here and, and uh, so many good places to eat and drink and talk. Uh, uh, it's uh, similar to why so many Oregonians are so well-traveled. I think that Portland's embrace of independent film, foreign film and such, speaks to, um, well, why not let's flatter ourselves, the education and perspicacity of the populace. Um, but, but, you know, it's true that I, I will hear more from, if I, if I write a negative review of a small film that uh, catches on, I will hear from more people than if I write a negative review of a big film that catches on. Although nothing is as interesting as hearing from Rocky fans. Uh, you didn't know that you could convert alphabet blocks into email, but you can. <coughs> um, the, the numbers are hard to come by. Um, the film industry uses numbers the way, um, well, you know, you've seen these commercials for natural enhancement on television. Um, people lie about how much their movies make and they don't like to share information about what their movies cost and what they made. And, um, <clears throat> everything is a hit if you talk to somebody connected to it. There's an old joke about two Hollywood producers meeting at lunch and one says, hey, how'd your new movie open? And the guy says, terrific. And he says, terrific? Gee, that's too bad. You know, the, the, terrific is sort of a bad result. Um, so so I, in many cases, I only have anecdotal information to back up some of what I'm saying about Portland as a movie-going city. But here are some interesting numbers. Um, in a, in, in a reasonably hasty five to ten minute drive from this hotel <clears throat> or a walk, we have the following screens devoted to alternative film. Ten at the Fox Tower, six at the brand new living room theaters, one at the Northwest Film Center who until recently had two, one at Cinema 21, three at the Hollywood Theater, four at the Laurelhurst Theater, one at the Clinton Street Theater, one at Cinemagic, and depending on what they're showing, two McMinimins theaters, the uh, Mission and the Baghdad. So depending on if you add the McMenamins in, that's 29 screens devoted to alternative film in the downtown core area. If you look at the commercial screens, you have six at Pioneer Place, four at the Broadway, and I think the Broadway is changing and 16 in total with the two cinemas at the Lloyd Center, the, uh, the one in the mall and the, the big one outside, for a total of 26. So just in raw numbers, looking at what you have to choose from on a given night, if you are in the downtown, you have more alternative film to choose from than commercial film. And you know, I, I, whenever I go anywhere, I look to see what's playing at the movies. Um, Honestly, the only city I can think of that has that situation, more houses showing alternative film than current contemporary commercial film, is Paris, France, where on a given night you can watch you know, a Fritz Lang Western and, and a Marx Brothers movie, but it's kind of hard to find uh, Casino Royale or, or, or Norbit. <laughs> and, and you know, it's not only downtown. You know, we have neighborhood theaters, you know, in the outer lying areas, uh, the Moreland, the Academy, uh, the St. John's, the Joy Theater in Tigard, the Lake in Lake Oswego. They mix non-traditional films, non-commercial films in with the things they regularly show. It's a true phenomenon. Um, here, here's the amazing stat, um, and I only thought of this after I compiled these numbers. Vancouver, Washington, I have no idea if we're the 24th largest city, I have no idea what, where Vancouver ranks. Does anyone? Um, top 100? I'd, I'd be surprised, yeah? They have two theaters that specialize in independent and <clears throat> non-traditional film. The Cinetopia, and I'll have more to say about Cinetopia in a bit, and the City Center, which is a regal cinema in downtown, they had so many people <clears throat> asking if they had to come back to Portland at night to see a good movie that they started showing them in Vancouver. I have friends who live near I-5 in North and Northeast Portland who say that it's easier for them to hop on the freeway and cross the bridge. They can walk right into the city center and they see the same films that are playing at the Fox Tower. <clears throat> no lines, no crowds, no parking. <clears throat> Pardon me. So, you know, th th this is an amazing 
statistic. Again, if you pick up the New York Times and look to see what's playing there, yeah, they get movies before we do, but they don't keep them very long, and they don't have as many screens, certainly not uh, as high a percentage, playing alternative film. Um, over the years, I've had the occasion twice to win a bet with a filmmaker saying, your movie is going to be very popular in Portland, and they've said, yeah, right, buddy, and then six months later, sending them an email or actually running into them in one case and saying, do you remember that phone conversation? That picture is still playing at the Hollywood Theater in Portland. And the guy said, in one case it was Jonathan Demme, the director of Philadelphia and Silence of the Lambs. Uh, he had uh, Neil Young, Heart of Gold last year. And when I interviewed him at Sundance, I said, this picture will play in Portland from February until the summer, I'm sure of it. And I sent him an email and he said, you know, I thought that was just blue sky thinking, yes, you're just being kind. But he was impressed and he had kept an eye on it. Um, other pictures, Whale Rider, Secret of Roan Inish, the story of the weeping camel. Apparently if you do something with an animal, uh, indigenous music and a cute little kid, it'll play in Portland forever. Um, Army of Shadows, the, uh, the story of the French uh, resistance during the war, um, played in Portland longer than it played in New York City. The Puffy Chair, which is an independent film that played here last year, got something like 45% of its overall gross playing at the Fox Tower in the Hollywood. Um, those people are real keen on Portland. Um, and, and it's not only the movie theaters, we have um, I, I swear to you, again, as a world traveler who walks into video stores wherever he goes, Movie Madness is the most amazing video store in the world. Um, it is what Powell's is to bookstores, but it also has all that memorabilia. You know, you can take out-of-town visitors there and it's free and it's got museum pieces like uh, the shotgun from the man who killed Liberty Valance and uh, dresses worn by Mary Pickford and one of Orson Welles' suit from uh, Touch of Evil. Um, it, you know, again, that speaks to the film culture here. Little neighborhood video stores like Video Verite and Watch This and Impulse and, and Trilogy thrive even with competitors like Hollywood Video, which is a local company, and Blockbuster right in their faces. Um, something about Oregonians, would th we'd rather do business with the local guy, particularly if he's offering something that's hard to find at the big guy. And that goes for food, that goes for books, and it goes for movies. <clears throat> um, Susan mentioned the Portland International Film Festival, which begins today, which is I think if you count features and shorts, it's something like 111 films from 17 countries, or m more countries than that, uh, playing in 17 days. It's an annual event, it's in its 30th year. They, they fill, I, I don't wanna say they sell tickets because they, some people buy a pass and go to many, many screenings, but they fill 30,000 seats, more or less, in those 17 days um, downtown. We have um, the Cascade Festival of African Film running now. It's a free event at, at Portland Community College Cascade Campus. We have annual um, film festivals for Jewish film, gay, lesbian, bi, and trans film. Um, we have experimental film festivals, it seems to me, virtually every other week. <clears throat> we have um, our alternative to Sundance, which is the Longbaugh Film Festival put, by, put on by Willamette Week and Dave Walker, their former film critic. Um, it, and that spreads out into the state, too. We have thriving festivals in Ashland and Bend. It seems to me not a month or two goes by that I don't hear from somebody who's thinking, you know, we're going to start a film festival in Astoria, Hood River, Salem. Um, people in those communities read about what's going on in Portland, <clears throat> hear about it, they visit here, and they, they go to the Fox Tower, and they see 10 movies that they'll be lucky to see back home, and they want these film festivals. Now, um... Making movies is another part of this. You know, movie makers are also movie consumers. And we have a long history of filmmaking in Oregon. That's not necessarily different from that of other similar states, uh, Colorado, Minnesota, New Mexico, states that, you know, offer unique environments for filmmakers to shoot in but don't necessarily have the super infrastructure that you need to support a full-time film and television business. Um, you know, one of the greatest films I've ever seen, The General, with Buster Keaton, was shot in Cottage Grove. 
Um, and there were the, a few Westerns shot in Central Oregon over the years, uh, Bend of the River with uh, James Stewart. Apparently, <laughs> the film crews made quite an impression on the locals who called it Bend of the Elbow. Um, Paint Your Wagon, which uh, I think people are still recovering from in some parts of Eastern Oregon. Uh, the Great Northfield, Minnesota Raid, which I know they're still recovering from in Jacksonville. They hardly let anybody shoot a, a, a family snapshot on the streets there anymore after those guys came through town. <clears throat> um, over the years, as you know, the, the state and uh, some municipalities have, have made efforts to uh, induce filmmakers to come here and shoot films. You know, even a modestly budgeted Hollywood film, um, and by modestly budgeted, $20 million. Um, their production expenditure, if they come to a location like Oregon, they, they, they might easily drop $6 million of that 20 here. So it's worth giving these guys a break on parking and taxes and renting lights and yeah, you can use uh, PGE Park, things like this. Um, it's hard to lure these people here, you know. 49 other states are trying to do it because these are, you know, it's a lot of money. Um, in our case, a lot of the things that recommend Oregon as a film location, if they just stay on the plane another half hour, they cross the border and they're in BC, and they can do it in Vancouver with similar conditions, similar light, similar backdrops, and significantly less cost due to the uh, dollar value in Canada. BC also has an advantage, you know, if you, if, you, if you transpose a map of Canada over a map of the United States, you realize that Vancouver is Los Angeles. It's the southwesternmost part, and I think a lot of Canadians move there because it's moderate compared to, say, Saskatoon and Lord knows where else. Um, and as a result, they have a lot of film crews. Um, Oregon can support several productions at a time, but BC can shoot 12, 15 Hollywood budget features at a time. There are that many people there who have that much experience so that they, you can just sort of parachute in and pick up your crew in Oregon. I don't know, we have, we have many talented people, but a lot of them are untested, or they, they work in the type of films that perhaps uh, don't necessarily recommend them to people who are wielding $20 million budgets. You know, I made these great experimental films, you have to see them, that's nice. Um, so, you know, we're, we're competing on, in, in several ways. Um, we're, we're competing fairly successfully, it seems to me. You know, the, the, the um, State Film and Video Office speaks about 240-ish million dollars a year, that, that, that neighborhood, in film production in the state. Quite a bit of that is um, car ads shot in the gorge and, and uh, infomercials from Taiyi and some other producers in town. Um, some of it is stuff that would have been shot here anyhow, like Gus Van Zandt's films. Um, but by the same token, as was pointed out to me by somebody years ago, no matter what you think of these projects, they're all four star as it relates to the state economy. They're bringing movies in, they're getting people working, they're creating buzz in the filmmaking community that Oregon is a place where you can make movies, and, and proof of that is that we get repeat business. Lakeshore Entertainment was here last year, shot a film called Feast of Love with uh, Morgan Freeman, Greg Kinnear, um, a little uh, uh, Robert Benton film, the man who wrote um, Bonnie and Clyde and directed Kramer vs. Kramer and you know, a little sort of character-driven ensemble piece, and now the same company is back shooting an FBI serial killer thriller, Untraceable, with Diane Lane. Yeah, I'm sorry, does anyone buy Diane Lane as an FBI agent, Do you, you know? Um, at any rate, you know, as I say, B minus movie, four stars economic, so uh, take your pick. Um, I, I, rather than leave talking about filmmaking with that crowd, I want to recommend to you our local filmmakers. Um, as it happens in our fair city, and not too many cities this size in the world can say this, we have two Oscar-nominated, um, multiple prize-winning directors who live and work here, Gus Van Zandt and Todd Haynes, um, continued. Uh, if you've seen um, 
any of Gus's films, you know he uses Portland a great deal. Um, even the, the one film he wrote about a Northwest musician who kills himself, he had to go to New York to shoot it for various reasons. But if you didn't see the license plates, you could have sworn that thing was shot in you know, Forest Park and, and environs. Um, Todd has never shot a film in Oregon, but he writes here and he lives here and he edits here. And he told everyone who asked about Far From Heaven, the film for which he was nominated for a screenwriting Oscar, that the film was inspired by his time in Portland, that the rich colors and the, the focus on the physical beauty of the, the sets, remember one of the characters was a landscaper, was inspired by being here. Um, we have two Oscar-winning animators in town, Joan Gratz and Will Vinton. We have um, Jim Blashfield, who has an MTV Music Video Lifetime Achievement Award for his work with the Talking Heads and Michael Jackson. There are some other animators in that generation of, of uh, people who were around when the Vinton Studio first started um, who have had one-person shows at the Museum of Modern Art, Joanne Priestley. Shell White is another uh, animator from that generation. We have a thriving, thriving experimental film community. They put on their own festival every year, the PDX Fest. It's um, run by a fellow named Matt McCormick who's had several short films shown at Sundance. And it is the most unique event. Um, the, the annual, uh, what are they called? The World Championship of Experimental Film. They invite a dozen or so filmmakers to make a three to five minute film for that event. The audience watches them all and votes on a winner. A couple of years ago, when you showed up at the Guild Theater, rest in peace, um, you were being filmed as you came in by people with Super 8 cameras. During the intermission, those guys went into the men's room at the Guild, developed the film, edited it together, and they showed it in the second half of the program as an entry in the competition. The prize winner that year was uh, another talented young filmmaker named Vladimir. It's a young woman. She only goes by Vladimir. She gave everyone in the Guild a Viewmaster. Yeah, GAF Viewmaster, click, 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 click. Then they used to make those down in Tigard, and they poisoned everyone in the process. Um, <laughs> And, and she created her own Viewmaster wheels for everybody. Now think about this. Those wheels have what, like 12 pictures on them? So she had to cut the frames, 12, five or six wheels for everybody. So we're talking about 1,800 of these wheels. They turned on the lights in the guild and they played uh, uh, the audio track for this film. And you heard a beep and it was just like when you were in school and they showed uh, film strips. If anyone, uh, I might just be in the generation that saw film strips and nobody older or younger. But there was such a thing, and there was an audio track, an LP, and there would be a beep, and then you had to advance the film strip. Well, everyone did this, and you heard a beep on the soundtrack, and 350 viewmasters going ka -chunk -chunk. <laughs> But the most amazing thing was looking around and seeing the most jaded collection of Portland hipsters you could assemble in one place with ear-to-ear -ear grins. It looked like you know, they had found every egg on Easter morning. It was just great. Um, she won that year, by the way. She, she, she took home this sort of jury-rigged uh, bowling trophy, and she's about yay tall, and Matt McCormick is like 6'7", and he, he had to bend down to hand her the trophy. It's, 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 it's a charming event. It'll be on in April, the PDX Fest. Um, a few other filmmakers who've had multiple films at Sundance, Vance Malone, who works uh, with Food Chain Films, which is a commercial house where a lot of our most talented young filmmakers are employed. Andy Bluebaugh, who uh, used to work at the Film Center, the Northwest Film Center, um, just had his second film in a row at Sundance, short film, and uh, flew from Park City, how, how, how cosmopolitan is this, to uh, Chaminot, France for another festival. He couldn't even wait for Sundance to finish. He had to be flown to France. Um, you can do that in a city like Portland. You know, we talk about the young creatives and how it's, it's, it's still a town where five or six young people can share the rent on a house and keep half-time jobs and then work on their art, which is what they really do. And filmmaking is one of those arts. When uh, you, you consider now that digital filmmaking has made feature films uh, affordable to people without bankrolls and without uh, credit cards to burn up and without parents to leech off and you know they can make a feature film and get into the festival circuit and then get the attention of someone 
who, who will fund a bigger project, then a place like Portland is a magnet for those type of people, and we see a lot of activity. <clears throat> I mentioned um, the, the Northwest Film Center, and, and they are the uh, sponsors of the PIF, and I want to mention them as well in connection with the Hollywood Theater. Um, both of those uh, organizations are best known for the exhibition they put 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 on the the films they show. The Hollywood has three screens and shows a lot of alternative films. The Northwest Film Center comes out with a calendar. I mean, you know, that's the one document I can count on whenever their new calendar comes to say, what is that? You know, I hear about a lot of movies, but I'm not quite up to date with you know new waves in Algerian filmmaking. The Film Center fills that niche, thank goodness. Um, <laughs> But both of those organizations, um, the Northwest Film Center and uh, Film Action Oregon, which is the sponsors of the Hollywood, have tremendously important um, work that they do in reaching out to communities, student filmmakers, uh, showing films in venues other than their downtown or Sandy Boulevard locations. Um, the Film Action Oregon sponsors filmmakers with grants. I wandered into the Hollywood one day to see a screening and there were all these high school kids running around with cameras who were in a documentary workshop um, during the summer break. Um, the Film Center has a full school, but they also show films at the Interstate Firehouse. They put their, um, their Northwest Festival, the best of the Northwest Fest, on the road throughout the state and indeed throughout the country. Um, so, so in addition to being these um, sort of places for film geeks to, to watch something that you can't see even at, 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 at the Fox Tower. Um, they, they, in fact, uh, seed the community with interest in filmmaking and turn, you know, let kids make movies and then show the kids their movies and let them bring their friends to the Hollywood or, or to the Witzel and have a little film festival of student films. And I, and I think they're there to be um, <clears throat> commended for that. Um, Lastly, uh, 600 movies a year, 600 movies a year. That means if you go to the movies every day, you've missed 250 movies. You've missed 250 movies. Now, there, of course, there are movies that, you know, um, no one wants to go see, but they make a lot of money, which is a really strange thing. You know, The Hills Have Eyes 3, the second sequel to a remake. Um, you know, somebody somewhere has a spreadsheet and they say, you know what, if we put X into this, we're going to get X plus 5 out the end, let's do it. Um, and, and on the other hand, you know, new currents in Algerian filmmaking. I mean, you, most of the movies that I see and that we see, I'm, I'm assuming, fall into that middle. But that middle is vast. And you want to encourage people, if, if you're in a position like me, to look not only at the, the brightest thing in the middle, the thing with the most buzz, because you know buzz, buzz can be bought. You, you want to encourage people to look at the stuff that sort of satisfies the urge to be in the middle and yet isn't in the middle. So, for instance, something like The Queen, um, which is not, you know, exceptional movie making or, you know, the greatest performance ever given or the, the, the most challenging script. But it feels like a movie that, oh, I don't know, Douglas Fairbanks Jr. could have been in in a good way. You know, it, it feels like sort of a meat and potatoes movie that has qualities. And cities like Portland keep movies like that alive. Eventually, they do find an audience if they're the right movie. And, and in the case of The Queen, it wound up playing on over a thousand screens, which I assure you, nobody associated with it could have predicted when it, when it was begun. But I think Portland audiences have had a role in encouraging distributors to get behind films in other markets. Uh, I was in Salt Lake City, I was in Park City for the Sundance Film Festival and talking to uh, the, the critic for the Salt Lake Weekly. And he was telling me what movies were coming to Salt Lake in the coming two or three weeks. And Salt Lake is a pretty similar city in size. Some of these pictures he was talking about opening at the end of January 2007 had opened in Portland in September and October of 2006 and were still playing here. And I don't know this for a fact. I, I have this conversation occasionally with, with publicists and executives of tiny distributors. 
I think when they see a film does well in Portland, they think, you know, maybe we can show it in Salt Lake or San Diego or Tri-Cities or, and this is great because it wasn't like this when I started here, not that I had anything to do with it, Seattle often gets our seconds in the movie business. It used to be the rule was you never open Portland before Seattle and now it's almost the other way around. They get middle-sized films before we do. We get small films before they do and those are the films, as you can see by the screen counts, that we seem to prefer. So it's great to be able to write for an audience like that because I'm not, you know, except for Rocky. Um, I, I, you don't get your feet put for the, to the fire to say, you know what, that movie that was number one at the box office was real garbage, but check out this thing that's playing at, you know, Cinema 21 or the Fox Tower. Thanks very much for your time, and I guess uh, we'll take some questions. Thanks, Sean. Um, it's your turn now. If you'd like to ask a question, just come on over here. Our first question will be asked by board host John Horvick. John is a member of the uh, City Club Board of Governors, and he's co-chair of the New Leaders Council. He works at OHSU, and he's director of the Parents and Children Together Study. John. Thank you, Sean. Um, you broached this topic just a little bit with digital filmmaking, but I'm like you to extend it maybe a little bit. With the increasing capabilities of um, online distribution of movies and things like YouTube and maybe Apple's iTunes, two different sort of things, but both online distributions, what sort of effects do you expect that to have on movie making and movie watching? Well. I was hoping to win the lottery before this thing got very big because I can easily see 600 movies a year becoming 6,000 uh, before 2010, uh, or 2110 rather. Um, the, 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 the sheer volume and ease of making movies is, is intimidating because, you know, in the past you had you know, kind of these vulgarian gatekeepers like Louis B. Meyer and Harvey Weinstein, and say what you will about them, they had a taste, they stuck to it, they put the movie out and you knew what you were getting. But if you open your email box and there's 5,000 movies, which one do you open first? Who do you trust to tell you which one to open first? Um, I'm a gatekeeper in a very small sense, but, you know, we, we get flooded. Um, I did say I was going to mention Cinetopia, and Cinetopia, I think, is one of the answers. You know, people want to go to the movies. Uh, people, the only thing that I can think of that's like movie going, in that it's a social dating activity or just a leisure activity, a drop-in activity, is kind of going to a club to hear some jazz. You don't necessarily say, well, I'm only going to see guys who play this style of jazz on this instrument. You know. People just like to go and be in that environment and, and see that. But they don't do that with the symphony. They don't do that with pop concerts. They don't do that with um, you know, the big arena shows. They do it with movies. People say, I feel like going to see a movie. No one says, I feel like going to see the ballet, look in the paper and see what's on. Or I feel like going to see an, you know, some paintings. But people do this with the movies. So the movies have that built-in advantage. And a couple of niche products, and again, this speaks to Portland as a place that consumes independent film. The Cinetopia Theater in Vancouver and the Living Room Theater right here, right around the corner. Um, these people got the idea, so I believe Cinetopia had it first, credit where credit's due, of making the film going experience more luxurious. You know, you're, you're in a leather captain's chair with an ottoman. You can get a glass of wine and a plate of tapas or some good, you know, uh, pastry or something, not, not, you know, Mike and Ike's. Um, isn't that amazing? People go to dinner and then go to the movies, and what do they have to choose from to eat at the movies? You know, Red Hots. You know, do you ever order Red Hots at a restaurant? You know, with, with, I'd like a, a decaf and some Red Hots. You know, but yet uh, the, the 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 regal cinemas of this world think that that's what we want in the evening, and it's because well, I ate them when I was nine, and I used to go to the matinee. Um, <laughs> but but this this is a new model of movie going. You know, luxurious appointments. Specialty film, digital presentation, adult beverages, higher prices, yes, but you know what? When you paid $13 or $12 to see the movie, I think you feel more empowered to sh tell the dope next to you to turn off his phone. Whereas if you pay $6, you might feel a little timid about that, particularly at the $6 movies, you're surrounded by people on the phone. So I think that's, 
we may see more of these. Cinetopia is building a second theater in Everett, Washington, that's gonna be 18 screens up from the 10 they have here. Living Room is already in construction on a second theater in South Beach in Miami. I expect that we'll see more um, boutique theaters that make the going to the movie experience distinct from even the best download on the best plasma screen. My name is Edward Hershey, I'm a City Club member. I have two questions. The Oregonian's letter grade system seems so antithetical to the, what your reviewing is about. I wonder if you feel any special pressure having to put a grade on a movie. And secondly, your byline is not on every review. If you choose not to review a movie, is that itself a commentary on the movie? Um, the second question first, no, no. Um, you know, as six, 700 movies a year, I can't see them all. Um, I can't write about them all on deadline. Um, over the years, we've tried really hard to build a variety of voices. You know, the New York Times these days is using as many as seven reviewers in a given Friday edition. The three staff reviewers, Dave Kerr, Matt zoller Seitz, Jean, I, I'm not gonna pronounce her last name, Anita Gates, Larry Van Gelder. So, so you know, we're not unique in that. Um, very often there are two press screenings simultaneously and, and uh, I just can't do it. I try and assign my, my colleagues, Mike Russell and Mark Mohan, films that suit their strength. Mark has a lot more patience than I do with films about place that don't have dialogue. Um, Mike, on the other hand, has a lot more patience with The Hills Have Eyes 3. So, you know, it seems to me it's, uh, it's a service to the readership if the person who's at least potentially sympathetic to the thing sees it. Um, the letter grading system, of course, when we, when we had to give these movies stars, I was begging my editors for the letter grades. And now that we have the letter grades, I wish we were giving out stars. And here's why, I taught in universities for many years, and you know, people hate you when you give them a C. And we've all gotten a C, and we've all thought that the teacher who gave us the C was a jerk. And when you give a movie a C, the people who like that movie just think of that teacher. You know, they, 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 they can't read the argument, they just say, C, what a jerk. You know, it, it could be a terrible movie, but you know, uh, this gets into the personality of the critic and the personality of the reader. You know, some people just want to disagree with me and, you know, hey, great. You know, always disagree with me and you'll always know how you think. Um, but I think the letter grades do make that a little easier. You know, I, I keep a spreadsheet every year and it's sorted by letter grades. So the A's are on top and the F's are on the bottom. And um, when it comes time to slap that grade on them, I just look at the movies that have that grade and I think, okay, here's this movie that I'm weighing. And if it was in this group, would I watch it again sooner than these or not? Or would I you know, have an equal aversion to ever seeing any of these again? And that's how I wind up putting the grades on them. So it's not mathematics, but you know, it, 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 I can sleep with it. Um. Gwena Vermilia, City Club member. Uh, recently in the New Yorker magazine, there was an article by David Denby about the rise of the small screen and how much easier it will be to download movies and watch them on your iPod or on some box in your living room in the future. And you go to your blockbusters in Hollywoods and you're seeing television on DVD and television on tape and stuff that was made for the small screen being put next to the movies. Um, you touched on this a little bit in the rise of multiplexes and how unpleasant it can be to see a movie in, in those theaters, sticky floors, bad snacks, noisy patrons, um, bad sound. And I wonder if um, you have any thoughts. I mean, it's great that Portland has this wonderful independent um, screening system. Can Portland save big screens nationwide? Are, are people learning from Portland elsewhere? Um, what's, the, what's the fate of the big screen in the face of this onslaught of small screens? Well, you know, the, the people who own most of the big screens, and really it's the persons. I mean, you know, Regal Cinemas owns, they're, they're the number one chain and they're bigger than the numbers two, three, four, and five combined practically. You know, they, they were formed by, we used to have a huge, uh, multi-state theater chain in this city, Act Three, and when Philip Anschultz decided he was bored with uh, Quest and Major League Soccer and whatever else he owns, uh, he bought up movie theaters. And the two biggest chains he bought were Regal and Act Three, and I guess Regal had just 
put in carpeting in their corporate headquarters, so it's regal, and it's in Knoxville, but if we'd had nicer building over, uh, the, the Act 3 offices were above the uh, Guild Theater, if those were nicer, I think Act 3 would be the, the biggest chain and we'd never hear of Regal. Um, those people are in business for themselves and their business is, is these 18 plexes in the suburbs. And they can get kids in to see that. You know, you look at these numbers on Monday morning, $30 million for Norbit. Um, I'm picking on Eddie Murphy because he deserves it. Um, $30 million, and when you consider that, you know, probably half of that is kids who pay less so the average ticket price there is about six bucks. That means five million people went out to see it, which is more than bought the Da Vinci Code in hardback. You know, I mean, that, that's an enormous number of consumers in one 72-hour period. So that business isn't going anywhere because they've got those kids just brainwashed. Um, I think for the downtown independent theaters, you know, Tom Ranieri over at Cinema 21, who's really a hero of, of Portland uh, movie going, He's been telling me since the day I met him that this is it. I can't do this anymore. Right, we're going under. You know, and it, it, people in New York City have heard of Cinema 21. I mean, it, it's it's got a very good reputation. That sort of house again suits Portland very well. And now these new sort of multiplexes, the luxury plexes that show alternative films. I think that's the key. Paying $15 to sit in a nicer chair to see Hannibal Rising is not a business model. But $15 to sit in a nicer chair and see something you can't see anywhere else, I think people will leave the house for that. As, as they put in the living room theaters, and they've lowered their price. They wanted 15 bucks, and now they, now they want nine, which I think is wise. Um, it was going to be a test of how much frivolous income there was in the Pearl District. We were, Really going to see, you know, if if the uh, thirty thousand dollar countertop translated into the sort of purchase you have to reach into your pocket to make. But I, I, I think that specialty cinema that offers a specialty experience still has a future in Portland, and I think that Portland, just as it leads in exhibiting these films, can lead in a new way of showing them, as we see from these two theaters. They've, they've succeeded well enough to spawn uh, siblings, if not, you know, whole chains. Your discussion earlier about growing up in, with a film strip, um, I was one of those few who was <laughs> part of that generation. But it did bring to mind the fact that, oh, I'm sorry, Barbara Bott, City Club member, um, that also when I was growing up, teachers, educators used movies to further discussions of history or science in a more of a culturally uh, acceptable or adequate way so that, that kids had different viewpoints to, to draw on when they were talking about a specific event. And, and recently, um, Al Gore's movie has been distributed nationwide to educators. Um, and of course, excuse, all, all heck is broken loose. Um, so my question is, do you think that we're ever going to, uh, maybe in the Portland metro area or beyond in Oregon, get to the point where educators are again using our, the arts to further the history and the science and the discussions that, that kids need to have between each other and between educators and parents? Um, because that seems to have been lost somewhere uh, in our education manual between when I was growing up and when my kids were growing up? Well, I, you know, I, I, I can only speak anecdotally about my, my children's experience. My sons are uh, graduates of Wilson High School and they saw a lot of movies and I was always shocked that they were seeing so many movies, but they saw things like Malcolm X and Schindler's List. Um, in their Spanish classes they saw, I remember El Norte, uh, one of them saw it twice, um, uh, sophomore and senior year. Um, so I, th I think there are still teachers who do it. Um, I think that there, you know, there was a time when movie going was a little more special and people felt, yes, you know, we'll, we'll show them a film or we'll take them to a film and it'll make that much more impact. And now movie going has lost some of that sort of patina and maybe people had gotten away from that type of teaching. But as I say, you know, my kids at Wilson saw a lot of movies. So, 
Um, it always depends on the film, and, and uh, it always depends on the teacher. I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult for me to know, I, I, you know, because I don't know enough about what goes on at other schools. Uh, Kurt Wavering member, um, you know, films are, are clearly entertainment, but then we have something like Al Gore's piece on global warming, and I'm wondering what your thoughts and reflections are on uh, that kind of social message film, and is, are we going to have more of them, for example, and, and do they have impact? Well, um, gosh, in the last election, last presidential election cycle, there was a new film from uh, Robert Greenwald, a documentarian, virtually every week about some aspect of the Bush administration, uh, the, the 2000 election, the war in Iraq, something that he didn't like. And the Clinton Street Theater, you know, couldn't get those pictures in fast enough. They were, you know, doing great business with them. And for that matter, you know, we go back to A Birth of a Nation, um, 1917, Woodrow Wilson sees it at the White House and calls it history written with lightning. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's a tradition. It's not a, a tradition in the Hollywood cinema, although they sneak it in clumsily often in the form of melodrama and you know, comedy. Um, you know, a film like Blood Diamond is supposed to make you feel bad about buying an engagement ring, um, whereas probably makes you feel worse about buying a ticket to Blood Diamond. Um, <laughs> you know, it, these films now, they, they do benefit from this increased distribution cycle where, you know, you have broadband into your house and you can download a film about, oh, there's a film playing at the Clinton Street now about Mardi Gras beads and how Mardi Gras beads are made by, like, prison labor in China. And, you know, you go from you know, people drunk in Bourbon Street to people in jail in China making these beads. And that sort of documentary, even in a town like Portland, can only come in and out in a few days' time. It's not going to do a lot of business. But it could live forever on pay-per-view or at the video store or on, you know, some sort of download. Uh, I saw, who is it that's now going to let you buy movies onto your TiVo? Is it uh, Netflix or Walmart or somebody? You know, event eventually every machine in your house is going to be capable of downloading and showing you a movie. And eventually, um, the, the bandwidth will be enough that it'll only take a few minutes to download it. The way you download a song now, we're in the early days. You'll be able to download, you know, The Seven Samurai that fast, uh, probably in five years' time. I, I wouldn't think it would be even that much. Um, and then films like this do find the audience that's looking for them. But you have to know where to look. And the newspaper can help a little bit. Word of mouth communities can help. The, the film program that the City Club is going to do. You know, show movies like that to groups who want to see it. Um, the Robert Greenwald films, they did house parties through moveon.org to show those films to people. So you got, from your political mail list, you got an invitation to a movie. And that's another way to do it. Hi, I'm Greg Bordeaux. I uh, was just wondering what your thoughts were about Mark Cuban and his agreements with like Steven Soderbergh to do features for under $2 million and then his model for simultaneous distribution on theater, digital, download, and DVD. What, how do you think that might impact? Yeah, the, the question refers to uh, Mark Cuban, the, uh, the what is he, buy.com, and then he owns the Dallas Mavericks, and he's, uh, he's a big proponent of, of um, digital filmmaking and instant distribution both to theaters and on DVD or pay-per-view. And he and Steven Soderbergh did a film last year called Bubble that was simultaneously distributed on DVD, pay-per-view, and in the theaters. I don't even think it played in Portland. Um, and Bubble was a good name for it. Um, they, they, they didn't do it the first time out. You know, the, the, again, the, I'm not sure the distribution uh, the, groove has been sanded smoothly enough for it to work well. It seems to me clearly, you know, uh, possible. Your big stumbling block, though, is that the, there's so much money in selling tickets to movies. Like I say, five million tickets on the weekend, that's $30 million in admissions. Lord knows how much in candy and soda. I mean, you're, you're trying to do away with a business that, you know, does five, eight billion dollars a year because you can get things to people faster, and I'm, I think there'll be a lot of pushback from the movie studios who have been in the business of, you know, movies are one of the only things that you cannot examine before you have to pay for it. 
right? You look at them, you know, you eat a meal and you can raise a fuss. You ever try and get your money back because you didn't like a movie? Um, you, you, you see what's playing, you buy your ticket, you go in, and then, you know, you're on your own. Um, that's a good business to be in, you know. Uh, um, Barney Balaban, who ran Paramount Pictures, was a, a Russian immigrant. His mother noticed a business where people were giving their nickels and then going in, and she thought, you know, that's a good business. They, you, no one was coming out and getting their nickel back. So until you have a way to appease that aspect of the business or make up for those eight billions of dollars in admissions, I think that there's always going to be resistance to it. But, you know, technologically, it seems inevitable. B.J. Seymour, City Club member. I'm curious about porn films. You haven't mentioned that. The Jefferson has been in existence forever. Where do porn films fit into this picture in Portland? Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> this is, I used to work at a magazine called Box Office, and we reviewed everything, including porn, um, and we had freelancers for that. And this was in the days before email, and those envelopes would come in, and they would sit on the desk for a couple of days before me and the other editor would, you know, sort of toss a coin and see who was going to open it this month. Um, you know, I guess, and, and this is, you know, I, I am a babe in the woods in this. Um, I, 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 I don't consume them. I don't read the porn trades. I don't go to the porn convention in Vegas, which is opposite the Consumer Electronics Show, which seems to me like <laughs> all you need to know. Um, but I think it's become a home video business, um, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, I'm sure the Board of Health is really happy about that. Um, people, you know, when, when apparently there was a golden age of porn, and, and I, I was a teenager then, and I didn't know it, you know? It's be, like being in, in Liverpool in 1961, but you like classical music. You can't be bothered with those guys in the basement at the Cavern Club. Um, and when they went from shooting on celluloid to shooting digitally, the whole distribution model changed. Um, a lot of the multiplexes, you know, there was an era in the early 70s when it was chic to show porn films. Uh, uh, I Am Curious But Yellow, Deep Throat, uh, The Devil and Miss Jones. Um, a lot of theaters at that time, a lot of theater circuits then had to sign leases saying they would not show pornography anymore. You know, I can tell you that uh, the Pioneer Place Theater, which was originally supposed to be a Sundance Center, which was going to be the first iteration of the Cenotopia Living Room Theater, and then they ran out of money. Um, they have a lease that says they cannot show NC-17 films, let alone porn. As you know, NC-17 doesn't necessarily mean pornography. It could be extreme violence or just something that makes Jack Valenti's successor feel funny. Um, and so it's harder to show them in theaters. You have to be a privately owned, usually a one-screen theater. Um, but the, you know, I, I, there's another thing that thrives in Portland is websites devoted to DVD. I can think of at least three that are here. And if you go to a website called DVD Talk, which is written and edited here, and you click on the adult content, you'll see there are hundreds of titles released a week. They just never play theaters. Uh, Jim Zarin, City Club member. You rattle off the names of some uh, New York Times film reviewers. I've always been curious. Do you ever read a review of a movie before you see it or, or after? Or, and do you calibrate sort of how you're doing mm -hmm. compared to other people? How do, you, how do you deal with comparisons of your reviews with other professionals? Well, I, I never read anything about a movie before I go see it or, or even before I write about it. Um, it just strikes me that I'm, I, I, I'm just, I'm like Zelig. I'm gonna wanna steal those ideas and those sentences. So it's a better discipline for me just to not know and, and be solipsistic and inside my own head and come up with my own sentences and reactions. And then of course you rise from the fumes on your desk and you see this thing that you're lauding as the, uh, the new 400 blows has gotten D minuses across the board. Um, there, there are wonderful websites uh, that collect critics' reviews. There's Rotten Tomatoes, which to my mind, RottenTomatoes.com, which to my mind lets in too many people. There's a lot of, you know, Joe's Movie Page.com reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, and, and weirdly, you have to apply for membership, and, and I know journalists here in town who are, are totally legitimate, who can't get their stuff on Rotten Tomatoes. There's a more selective one called Metacritic, and they do um, film, uh, DVD, books, and video games, and music. 
and they use major newspapers. That's, that's what they collate, but they, they do a really good job of reading a review and giving it a grade of zero to 100 based on the critics, you know, their perception of what the critic would give the movie, and they have a score that they assign to the movie. But the nice thing is, on a Friday morning, you can turn on Metacritic and see, I can see where my response ranks among, you know, I have many friends who have this job. I used to edit some of them when I was a magazine editor. I see them every year at uh, Sundance and other festivals. You know, we correspond occasionally if there's a story that involves Portland in another city. And, you know, I'm a consumer of their reviews and I trust them and don't trust them just as far as I trust or don't trust myself. I mean, you know, it's just one guy. I, whether, you know, the New York Times endorses it, the Oregonian, or my weekly reader, it's just one guy. Um, no one here would let me order their dinner, you know, so I, I don't know, you like capers, ugh, you know. <laughs> So, you know, it's, just, it's, it's nice to see, but it's more like, you know, I think, oh, that idiot, what is he thinking, you know, which is probably how people read my stuff. And, and I do consume it. My favorite critics tend to be the ones who are wordsmiths. You know, I do have a degree in poetry, and I'd rather write than be right. Um, and so I, Roger Ebert's a wonderful writer. Stephen Hunter, Anthony Lane, um, Joe Morgenstern. Most of those guys have Pulitzer Prizes for criticism for a reason. Um, Kenneth Turan at the LA Times, Michael Schragow at the uh, Baltimore Sun. I'm, I'm gonna leave people out, but you know, these are some of the people I know them. Um, I've worked with them, I read them, I admire them, you know, but I don't read them beforehand because, like I say, I'm a magpie. If you, oh my God, he's absolutely right, of course, and you know, I was totally wrong, I can't do that. I have to, I have to follow my own bizarre inclination. One of the things that um, is that I find disappointing to myself personally is, especially in TV movies, is a lot of them now are pretty much the same film with different actors, the same content with different actors. And I want to know what your view is on that and also what your take is on growth films, uh, films that empower people, spiritual growth films, things of that nature, and how come we're not seeing more of those? Um, second question first. Uh, the, 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 um, there, there's a huge movement now in the wake of um, The Passion of the Christ. There are, um, I, I get notices about uh, Latter-day Saint film productions. The, the, they never play downtown Portland. They play like out in Cornelius and, and um, Wilsonville, but they come here maybe seven or eight of them a year. Uh, 20th Century Fox now has Fox Faith, which is gonna release six or eight films a year. I, I think they opened one today called The Last Sin Eater, which they did not deign to let us see in advance of publication so we don't have an opinion on it. Um, but there is, there is a trend, you know, I thought one of the, one of, one of the uh, pratfalls of last year was New Line Cinema had Mike Rich's film, The Nativity Story. It's Christmas. You got a movie about the birth of Jesus and you made $30 million? You should be ashamed of yourselves. How can you not promote that in such a way that you've got the highest grossing film of all time? Who, you know, you don't have to sell that many tickets to beat Titanic. No one's come close yet. Um, it's happening. Um, I'm not sure they know how to market them. For instance, why don't they send us screeners of The Last Sin Eater or the LDS films? Why didn't they make money with the Nativity Story? I don't, I don't know if they know how to do it. Um, as far as movies being like other movies, ha, 250 a year. If one stands out on December 31st, I write that date like on my desk with a pen knife. You know, it's, 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 um, it's, it's a business that thrives on what just happened. Everyone in Hollywood wants to be the second guy to do it. Let the first guy take the risk. I'll figure out how to cut a corner. I'll make more money. I'd like to thank our members and guests for participating here today. I'd like to thank our radio and television audience for your interest in City Club. And I'd like you to join me in thanking Sean Levy for a fascinating view of the Portland film world.
We are adjourned. <laughs>